Jesus' hour has come. He's about to go to the cross. And in the time that remains, he could have gone to a mountainside alone to pray, as he's done before. But he's spending intimate time with his disciples, preparing them. John gives us an extended look at this evening, which started in chapter 13, when Jesus washed their feet, called out Judas, and told them he was giving them a new commandment to love one another. Through chapter 14 and then chapter 15, Jesus continued to unfold what was coming and what he expected of them. He's given them assurances and amazing promises, like the fact that the Helper, the Holy Spirit, would come and abide in them and teach them. But their hearts are surely troubled still. Jesus is leaving. That's troubling enough. But he also just told them that the world will hate them and persecute them. He's about to tell them more of what's ahead. I'm in John chapter 16, verse 1, reading from the New American Standard Version. These things I have spoken to you so that you may be kept from stumbling. They will make you outcasts from the synagogue. But an hour is coming for everyone who kills you to think that he is offering service to God. These things they will do because they have not known the Father or me. But these things I have spoken to you, so that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told you of them. These things I did not say to you at the beginning, because I was with you. In chapter 15, verse 11, Jesus said, these things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be made full. And he'd been telling them things like, abide in me, and you'll bear much fruit. I have loved you, abide in my love. And if you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. Those things would bring joy. Now he's telling them the hard things. And he says, these things I have spoken to you to keep you from stumbling. He's telling them what the persecution will look like. He doesn't want them to be shocked and be tempted to fall away from the faith because of the affliction that comes at them. He's saying this is what will happen. You'll be outcasts. People will even want to kill you. You need to remember that I'm telling you this. What a faithful savior to prepare their hearts in this way. Peter was listening and by the spirit of God, he prepares our hearts in the same way. In 1 Peter 4, 12 through 14. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing as though some strange thing were happening to you. But to the degree that you share the suffering of Christ, keep on rejoicing, so that also at the revelation of his glory, you may rejoice with exultation. If you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory and God rests on you. This is what it means to follow Christ. We share in his sufferings. Continuing verse 5. But now I am going to him who sent me, and none of you asks me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. But I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And he, when he comes, will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. And concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you no longer see me. And concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world has been judged. 
I have many more things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. But when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will disclose to you what is to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of mine and will disclose it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore I said that he takes of mine and will disclose it to you. Jesus tells them more about the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Jesus is going to the Father, but they will not be left alone. The Spirit of God will come and he will convict the world. I love that the Spirit brings conviction. It's a mercy that he lets us know when our attitudes, words, and actions fall short of the glory of God. So we can repent and continue in close fellowship with God. Jesus has told them so much and there's so much more. But in his wisdom, he says, you can't bear it. The Spirit will reveal these things to you. He will guide you into all the truth and disclose what's to come. And just as Jesus said of himself countless times, he tells them that the Spirit will not speak on his own initiative. Whatever he hears, he will speak. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one. I love that we too can depend on the Spirit to lead us to truth. The Spirit gives us understanding of the Word of God, helps us to apply the Word to our lives, helps us discern what to do in given situations. Ephesians 1.13 says when we believe we are sealed with the Holy Spirit. We praise God for the ministry of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit helps us to cling to God. Continuing verse 16. A little while and you will no longer see me. And again a little while and you will see me. Some of his disciples then said to one another, What is this thing he is telling us? A little while and you will not see me, and again a little while and you will see me. And because I go to the Father. So they were saying, What is this that he says a little while? We do not know what he is talking about. Jesus knew that they wished to question him, and he said to them, Are you deliberating together about this? that I said a little while and you will not see me and again a little while and you will see me? Truly, truly, I say to you that you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will grieve, but your grief will be turned into joy. Whenever a woman is in labor, she has pain because her hour has come. But when she gives birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish because of the joy that a child has been born into the world. Therefore, you too have grief now, but I will see you again, and your heart will rejoice, and no one will take your joy away from you. So a glimmer of good news. Jesus said he was leaving, but now he's saying they'll see him again, and not later after he prepares a place, he says in a little while. And he's definitely letting it be known that it's about to get really hard. They will weep and lament. They will grieve. It'll be like the pain of childbirth. But there will be joy on the other side. Joy that no one can take away. In the midst of their sorrow, that's something they can hold on to. Continuing verse 23. In that day you will not question me about anything. Truly, truly, I say to you, if you ask the Father for anything in my name, he will give it to you. Until now, you have asked for nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive, so that your joy may be made full. This is now the fifth and sixth time Jesus has said, ask, ask in my name. 
ask the Father for anything, he will give it to you. I'm reminded of James 1 when it talks about enduring trials and it says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all generously and without reproach and it will be given to him. What a loving God who is also an all powerful God. He invites us to ask for what we need, ask for help. Jesus says, ask for anything in my name. This is a promise for us as believers. As we abide and cling, we ought not hesitate to run to God and ask. The promise is that he will give it. Continuing verse 25. These things I have spoken to you in figurative language. An hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figurative language, but will tell you plainly of the Father. In that day you will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I will request of the Father on your behalf, for the Father himself loves you, because you have loved me and have believed that I came forth from the Father. I came forth from the Father and have come into the world. I am leaving the world again and going to the Father. His disciples said, Lo, now you are speaking plainly and are not using a figure of speech. Can we just pause and praise Jesus? He came forth from the Father. He left the glories of heaven and came into this dark world. A world that would, for the most part, reject him. He humbled himself and put on human flesh, still being God, and walked among us. He is headed to the cross and will endure a brutal death to save us. This will forever be an astounding sacrifice. And right now, he's spending his time comforting his disciples, telling them the eternal plan of God. He will leave the world again and go to the Father. Continuing verse 30. Now we know that you know all things and have no need for anyone to question you. By this we believe that you came from God. Jesus answered them, Do you now believe? Behold, an hour is coming and has already come for you to be scattered, each to his own home, and to leave me alone. And yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. These things I have spoken to you, so that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but take courage I have overcome the world. Jesus is about to endure immense agony and these disciples are about to leave him alone. But he knows he won't be alone. And again, his concern is for them. He said before that he's spoken these things so that his joy may be in them. Now he adds, so that in him they may have peace. The grief will be very real, but the joy and the peace are in him. In fact, Jesus gives another promise. The promise that in the world, we will have tribulation. We can't avoid it. Satan is the God of this world. It's a fallen world with fallen people. But he assures us that we can take courage because he has overcome the world. This is the blessing of clinging to God. We endure trials and tribulation, but we are not overcome by them. We're clinging to the one who has all the peace, the one who can make our joy full, no matter what is happening around us. We can take courage because Jesus left heaven and came into this world and conquered it, and we are his. Let's praise the one we cling to, the one who is greater than all.